Okay, so dear colleagues, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I guess it depends where you live. Uh, my name is Professor Thomas Rimelet. I am an anesthesiologist and intensivist working in Lyon in France. And I'm very happy to share this uh, webinar tonight. This webinar is entitled Extracorporeal Pathogen Adsorption for the Treatment of Bloodstream Infections in the Critically Ill. Um, I would like to thank very much our sponsor for tonight, which is uh, the Xterra Company. We will have two speakers who know very well the technology of Seraph, this product we are going to talk about uh, tonight. First of all, we're gonna have uh, the lecture of Professor Jan Kirstein from, um, from, he's the director of nephrology and rheumatology and the blood purification department at the academic teaching hospital of Braunschweig in Germany. And then for the second part of the symposium, we're gonna listen um, my colleague, Dr. Wow. Céline Monard, who I have the chance to work with in Lyon at Edouard Ayo Hospital. I would like to uh, give you just a, a few information regarding what you can do during this uh, symposium. First of all, the symposium is recorded. So everything what we say is recorded and we'll be able for other colleagues to get access later on on internet. And for uh, the audience who is attending the symposium, we have the Q&A option. So we're gonna ask the questions to the speakers at the end of the symposium. So you can, uh, you can ask your question at the Q&A, the question of the Zoom uh, software. You can also uh, chat, you can use the chat, the discussion, the chat is uh, open for you. And then I can uh, ask the question uh, on, on your behalf if you want. And you can also, uh, you can also hand, uh, raise your hand if you want uh, uh, to, to speak, it will be uh, possible. So uh, again, uh, welcome. And I will just for five minutes, give a brief introduction on, on that topic of blood purification. So um, this is uh, the blood purification. This is like conflicts of interest. I work with these different companies, including Xterra. And uh, you know what is important to remind to everybody is that this concept of blood purification is not a very new concept. Already 100 years ago, Sir William Osler said, except on few occasions, the patient appears to die from the body's response to the infection rather than from it. So already 100 years ago, we knew that the body's response was very important and it may be important to modulate this body's response in order to improve uh, patient outcomes. So what, is, what about this response? The response is here, you know, this is a, a double inflammatory response. Uh, you have two components, the pro-inflammatory component and the anti-inflammatory component. And then the net balance is more on the pro-inflammatory side during the first hours of this body's response. And then after a few hours, uh, the patient is on the anti-inflammatory side. And this, this state is extremely deleterious for the patient because you know that at this time, the patient cannot fight against nosocomial infection, cannot fight against viral re reactivation because he is completely immunosuppressed. All of this is due to the release of all these mediators, the cytokines, but also other dams and, and the PAMs also are very important. So we have this, the, this whole inflammatory response. And the, the game here is to modulate this inflammatory response in order to restore the immune homeostasis. I think, it, this slide is also important because in this slide, you remind everybody that the, the, in the sepsis definition, the new sepsis definition, immunology is today part of this sepsis definition. As you can see in the first sentence 
of this sepsis three definition. It's, it is say that sepsis is defined as the life threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. And this is what we're going to talk tonight, the host response to the infection. So I think today and for today and tomorrow, the immunology is extremely important. It's part of our daily life as uh, intensivists. We are intensivists and we need to know a lot about immunology if we want to work in the ICU in the future. So what kind of blood purification techniques are available at this time in 2021? Well, we have, I think, four different categories. We have the sorbents, we have different sorbents who, which can target different things, different cytokines, the endotoxins. We have several CRT filters with specific properties. These properties can also provide to this CRT filter provide uh, some capacity to absorb different uh, cytokines or different or, or the endotoxin for some of them. And we have this, uh, these new blood purification therapies, including the CERAF. And tonight we are going to talk about the CERAF. These new blood purification therapies have been released on the market uh, during the last uh, few years. And this, they are new and they are capable of leukocyte adsorption, but also bacteria or and virus removal. And I think this is extremely important. It shows all the techn technological progress that have been done during the last few years. So the questions I, I have for the, our two experts tonight is what makes this product, this Seraph product, such a unique and promising therapy? What is the current evidence in the scientific literature and how to use this therapy in our clinical practice? This is what we are going to try to address tonight for you, uh, the audience from uh, all over the world. Um, last but not least, I would say, I think everybody agrees here that during the last few years, there has been a lot of technological progress on this uh, 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 on regarding extractable blood friction techniques. And I think my, my two colleagues tonight would agree that it's very important not to let this gap between our medical knowledge on sepsis pathophysiology and the technical progress to get too big, okay? So it's very good that the, the company, the industry is improving. They, they provide new technology, but we need to understand how this works. And I think this is also what uh, our speakers would, would like to address tonight is how to use these uh, therapies, uh, how, how they interfere with the sepsis pathophysiology. For which patients exactly? When exactly to start these uh, techniques and what to remove exactly? That's our, I think, questions for uh, the very near uh, future. So I was just giving you this brief introduction to uh, our webinar. And now uh, we're gonna hear uh, Professor Jan uh, Kirstein, again from Hospital of Brunswick in Germany about his results with the Seraph and what he thinks the best practice are uh, with this technique. Then we're gonna hear Celine with some uh, specific case reports that we, we've done here in, uh, in Lyon. And, and then we're gonna keep some time at the end of this webinar for your questions. And with that, I wish you a very pleasant uh, webinar. I think now I will give the, the remote control to Jan. Jan, that's, uh, thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Rimle, for uh, the nice introduction and overview. And welcome to all of you, hopefully at home, some of you uh, probably still at work at these very busy times. I'm very happy to talk about a subject that uh, deserves uh, some attention um, and always did so um, since um, 
uh, we discovered that an overwhelming infection has a deleterious effect on um, uh, the patient. So I, I have to try out how long the lag period between um, my mouse click and uh, the brown trike internet is, but obviously now we are ready to go to speak about extracorporeal pathogen adsorption for the treatment of bloodstream infections in the critically ill. So this is my conflict of interest. So uh, everything you hear from me, you can judge in the light of uh, uh, this conflict of interest. Um, and uh, this is the agenda for the next uh, 20 plus minutes. And uh, we will start with the question why a fast reduction of pathogens uh, it does make sense. Because I'm talking about a part of uh, sepsis that is not already sepsis. It's indeed the phase uh, that is leading to sepsis. And we start with a very old paper from 1913. And I really like this paper because the gist of that paper is still valid. It shows the relationship between the uh, number of bacteria and the mortality in um, a rabbit model. And what you can appreciate is that depending on the number of bacteria you inoculate into the lungs of those rabbits, you have a mortality ranging from zero to 100%. So obviously, not only size matters, but number matters. The number of bacteria has an impact on the outcome in severe infections. And we kind of address that uh, in a different way by acting fast and furious, not only in Hollywood, but also um, in hopefully all emergency departments around the world by giving antibiotics very swiftly um, in the early phase of hypotension in an infected patient. So because we have learned from this study and other studies that indeed, even though we don't have the gold mark anymore, we have the golden hour. We know that the first hour of treatment is really important to make a difference in terms of survival. And one reason for that is that um, the earlier you start the treatment, the faster you decrease the number of pathogens. And as I have just outlined, the number of pathogens has an impact on the outcome of patients. So why um, think about devices? Don't we have antibiotics? Well, yes, uh, we have uh, seat belts and still Mercedes-Benz uh, introduced uh, the anti-lock brake system uh, in 1978, even though we had already seat belts. Why was that? Because they knew that in a life-threatening situation, it's better to have one, two, maybe even three pathways to protect you from dying than one. And what we are currently doing in the infected patient is that we are only wearing a seat belt. We only give antibiotics and do surgical interventions, but that's basically it. There's no airbag, there's no anti-lock break, nothing. So um, uh, the idea uh, to remove pathogens from the bloodstream um, uh, is not very new. Um, you can see here a paper from Russia from 1986, and they used activated charcoal to uh, draw and remove uh, pathogens from the blood of patients. This was basically done to enrich the bacteria and to um, enable diagnostic procedures. But Many companies are now exploring ways to remove the actual pathogen from the streaming blood. And you can see here a very neat technology using nano wires. Um, and uh, this looks like an old toothbrush where the bacteria are caught by 
uh, those uh, uh, nano wires, and then they close around the pathogen and don't let it go. So it's uh, almost like a Venus trap. So we stay in nature and from the Venus trap, we go to the great crested grebe. In German, it's called Haubentaucher, and it's a great bird. Um, and you can uh, hardly uh, see the bird um, because it's hiding in the reed um, on uh, the uh, margins of uh, lakes and other waters. But you can hear the great crested grebe. So what has the great crested grebe to do with uh, pathogen removing technology? Well, the great crested grebe uses the reed to hide, to chill out, to um, 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 have uh, you know mate with uh, uh, the the female part, and they uh, of course uh, breed right there, being protected from um, from adversaries. When you look at the surface of a cell, it's not smooth. It also has reed kind of structures on the cell surface. And those uh, proteoglycans, they have heparan sulfate. And like the great crested grebe likes to hide in the reed, bacteria and viruses like to hide on the surface of cells by binding to the heparan sulfate. So far, so good. And some ingenious mind came up with the idea to trick bacteria and viruses into not binding to heparan sulfate, but to heparin. Well, the problem with heparin is it's uh, blood staining. So you cannot inject um, several thousand units to a patient uh, uh, without risking um, um, severe blood staining as a consequence. So the idea came up to use a non-porous seraph media um, and cover that with heparin. And um, uh, when you pump blood over this non-porous seraph media, then um, uh, you can see that uh, the pathogens attach to the immobilized heparin. It's immobilized, so it's not going back to the patient causing blood thinning. So why do I have the non-porous seraph media written here all over this thing? Because one uh, big mistake when we are talking about blood purification technologies is that people confuse different technologies. And non-porous is important because we have one product on the market that is applied in the later stages of sepsis where you have a full-blown cytokine storm and it's not non-porous it's porous so it's a structural difference and it's also a difference in the timing of when to use the device and you can always uh, tell if somebody is knowledgeable in the field when he or she asks, oh, well, can we use both devices in one patient at the same time? Well, you could, but then you have a problem in making clear what the pathophysiology is and how the different devices work. The binding of pathogens is unspecific, but you can see that the binding is significant. Um, it's ranging from about 40 to 100%, uh, and it binds bacteria and viruses alike. So with one pass through the seraph, you remove quite um, a number of pathogens. So this is in vitro data by Marlene Seffer, um, uh, summarized in a review paper. So let's go and have a look at the clinical data and ongoing studies. So the first uh, study we did with the seraph was uh, the first in man study in hemodialysis patients that had uh, a problem with an infection. So as some of you may know, dialysis patients, especially those with tunneled catheters, 
are prone to acquire bloodstream infections. So those patients were put on the seraph in combination with the dialysis treatment. And what you can appreciate here in uh, 15 patients is that when you do that, interestingly, there is no drop in blood pressure which is the regular finding in dialysis patients, especially in those having an infection. This was an interesting uh, observation in the phase one study where we just uh, looked at uh, possible side effects. We didn't see any. Um, uh, actually, our head nurse said, well, we should do this more frequently because in the first patient, we didn't have a single alarm through a four-hour treatment, which was really rare in this patient. So aside from uh, a stable blood pressure, we could appreciate an increase in oxygen saturation that was uh, interesting, but we didn't really pay a lot of attention to that finding until later. We, of course, looked at all the things that can happen when you pump blood over uh, a device, is there a drop in the hemoglobin level, is the white blood count going down, is the platelet count going down, does uh, protein stick to the column, what about immunoglobulins, and all the things I just mentioned were not influenced at all by this uh, treatment. Um, so what about efficacy? So we did a very interesting uh, um, case of a chronic dialysis uh, patient that had a staph aureus septicemia. Um, and uh, so we gave um, antibiotics uh, that were tailored to the uh, microbiological finding and still the uh, infection didn't resolve. So we put that patient on a hemoperfusion with the seraph, so no combination with dialysis. And what you can appreciate is that by the time we started the treatment, we had bacteria still being present in the blood. So we had a time to positivity of 26 hours in the blood sample we took uh, from the blood before it entered the seraph. At the same time, we took a blood sample after the seraph downstream, if you will. And interestingly, there was no bacterial growth. Two hours into the treatment, the time to positivity increased. So in other words, the number of bacteria went down. And again, in the venous blood sample or in the downstream of the seraph blood sample, no bacterial growth. And after two hours, uh, after four hours, um, uh, no bacterial growth was detected anymore. And uh, in the subsequent days, there was no reoccurrence of bacterial growth. So obviously in this patient, wearing a seat belt plus having anti-lock breaks, so giving antibiotics plus using the seraph took care of the infection. Um, the way we measure the amount of bacteria in the blood is uh, not a direct one. We do not count colony forming units anymore. What we do is we measure the time to positivity. Actually, we don't measure it. Um, um, uh, machines like this one here uh, is measuring the time to positivity in an automatic way. And uh, all the, those that are working in the ICU are paying attention to this time to positivity. And uh, what you can appreciate here is that uh, um, when you look at the upper curve that a uh, um, drop in uh, uh, or an increase in time to positivity from 16 to 20 hours um, in some bacteria means that you have two um, uh, lock stages of um, bacterial um, reduction. So it's uh, not a linear relationship. So um, a small drop in the time, a small increase in the time to positivity um, means that it has a substantial decrease in the number of uh, circulating pathogens. And indeed, and uh, this is something Marlene Seffer did during her time at the Helmholtz Institute for Infection Research in Braunschweig, you can appreciate here 
staphylococci binding to the surface of the serif material. So you can have this bloody obvious test. Yes, indeed, there are bacteria sticking to the serif ma uh, material, in this case, staph aureus. So these days, we're not concerned about staph aureus that much. We are more preoccupied with uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. And what we uh, have learned over the time is that um, the coronavirus does not only like our throat and our lungs, but it, it can also be found in the blood of patients. This is not really the case in outpatients that feel a little bit oozy, but otherwise well. Uh, it uh, increases a little bit in the people that need to be hospitalized, but it's very frequent and prevalent in patients that need the care of an intensive care unit. So there you have in the early phase of the disease, uh, a large amount of bacteria floating around, uh, of, of uh, virus floating around in the blood. And this uh, has been proven uh, lately by visualization. So what you see here in this picture is a thrombocyte and uh, adjacent to the thrombocyte, you can see uh, the three uh, uh, viral particles. Um, and um, so it's not only RNA that is floating around in the blood, it's real virus. And of course, um, I have shown you early on that viruses are also removed by the seraph. So um, um, it uh, was obvious that uh, one would try to use the seraph in COVID uh, patients. Does the seraph remove that in vivo? Yes, it does. And it depends really on the uh, amount of virus in the blood. The more virus you have in the blood, the higher uh, your um, uh, um, seraph clearance for the nucleocapsid protein. And if you only have small amounts of virus in the blood, the removal capacity uh, does not uh, seem to um, uh, be very large. And it's not an unspecific binding uh, of proteins in general. So as a control, we had total protein measured as well. And you can see there's no clearance of total protein. I even uh, broke down the scale uh, from zero to five here and magnified that um, uh, so that you can see there is no removal of, of proteins in general, but there is removal of the SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid protein. So we um, uh, came up with a registry that um, um, is uh, online and uh, to which uh, uh, many hospitals contributed so far. We have about 100 items we ask for uh, in the registry. And I show you data of an interim analysis uh, that uh, just got um, um, accepted in NDT. Um, um, 102 data sets were available to look at adverse events. Um, um, some patients were treated several times and four patients had to be excluded to, because of incomplete outcome data because we aim to follow, uh, do a follow-up of uh, 30 days. When you look at the basic characteristics, you could see that there was no difference between those that uh, survived and those that did not survive, um, uh, except for the 4C score. And the 4C score is a very specific um, COVID-19 score um, that had been developed uh, specifically for the disease. And you can see that the non-survivors had a higher 4C score. Uh, all the other parameters, height, weight, age, sex, distribution, uh, really didn't matter. The other interesting but not really surprising finding was that uh, non-survivors had a much higher uh, ferritin level. Um, uh, D-dimer was borderline significant. And this is important because these two parameters were, um, are uh, important for selection of patients in the early phase of the disease to decide whether or not to treat them with the seraph. Early is really important because what you can appreciate here is that 
the non-survivors were started on the seraph treatment about 13 days after the onset of symptoms and about uh, four and a half days after the, they were referred to the ICU. And uh, those that uh, survived uh, were treated within 10 days uh, of symptom onset and within two days of admission to the ICU. Um, so what you can see here in a multivariate analysis is that really that time to ICU admission uh, makes a difference. If you stay below 60 hours, you have a much better outcome of those patients, irrespective of other variables like ferritin, D-dimer, uh, comorbidity, and so on. And it really makes sense because the seraph is aimed to remove the virus and the virus will appear after about two weeks, 16 days maybe. So it does not make any sense to use the, the seraph uh, in week four of an ICU stay of a, of a COVID patient unless you want to remove bacteria, but this is a different story. So it's only aimed towards the initial phase of the disease. Uh, this is a summary slide, uh, and I want to point out that the circuit failure rate was really remarkable low, 8.8%. Uh, and um, 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 about 43% of the uh, treatments were done as hemoperfusion only, so patients were not uh, receiving renal replacement therapy at the same time. If they did receive renal replacement therapy, it was the whole array from intermittent to prolonged intermittent and continuous. And uh, when you uh, were looking at uh, anticoagulation, it was everything from heparin over citrate to uh, agatroban, so the whole uh, thing that we are used to. So those data are really in line with uh, data from the US where they looked at 61 patients treated with the seraph and compared those with historical controls. So unlike the COSA registry that only uh, um, contains patients that were treated, this analysis um, compare treated to untreated um, uh, patients. And again, what you can see here um, is a difference in mortality that is really remarkable. While both studies are remarkable and encouraging, but what we need, of course, is prospective randomized data. And there are prospective randomized data on the way um, for bloodstream infections, as well as for the treatment of COVID-19 patients. And I'm really looking forward to have those results available soon. So it's really important to point out that the seraph is something that cannot be compared to other devices. And I try to uh, make you aware of the fact that the structure, the underlying pathophysiology is different and also the timing of use is different to other devices. So for people that are uh, my age or older, there was a great song, nothing compares to you. And this holds true for the Seraph. So it's a first in class device that is neither comparable to toramyxin nor comparable to cytosolvents, neither in structure nor in timing of use because the Seraph should be used early in the case of a severe bloodstream infection or a COVID infection. And it should not be the premier choice when the cytokine storm is out there and it should not be the premier choice in the very late stage of the disease. So if you do it right, the seraph will take care of the severe infection and uh, you might not need other devices later on. So I think the seraph is adding to the armamentarium we are having. So we combine the seatbelt, the anti-lock brakes with even automatic brakes. Um, and that will hopefully help to save lives in the ICU in the case of bacterial and uh, viral infections. And with that, I am happy to uh, give the mic over uh, to uh, Celine.
thank you very much, Jan, for this interesting uh, presentation. Um, so now we, we're going to have Celine, who is getting ready for her talk. I just would like to remind the audience that they have the chat, and uh, on the chat they can uh, ask the questions for uh, the end of the session. Celine, uh, you have the, the microphone. Yes, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, yes, my name is Céline Monard and I'm working in uh, Lyon uh, University Hospital in the intensive care unit. So first of all, I would like to thank you very much for inviting me today. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And as uh, Professor Rinley previously said, I will talk to you about some of our case experience with Seraph in uh, our intensive care unit and the practices that we have with uh, hemopurification. Here are my disclosures, and I'm an investigator in one of the randomized studies involving the Seraph, the PMS study. So uh, Professor Kirchstein already uh, very uh, nicely presented to you the, the Seraph 100, so I will be very fast. Uh, the main aim that we use for us in the intensive care unit is of course removing pathogens from the blood, and this is one of our everyday uh, problems. Pathogens, it's uh, a central uh, point of uh, ICU uh, doctors and patients. So this for sure is very interesting for us. Initially, uh, CRF 100 was developed to remove the pathogens. Both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria can be removed, but also viruses, fungi, and toxins. So we'll speak a little bit about that. It can be very interesting. And uh, I would like to underline also this, uh, that drug-resistant bacteria can be removed by the CRF-100 microbiome. And this is uh, very interesting because you know that uh, we have a, a surge of COVID-19, of course, but also uh, we start to have uh, more and more patients that are infected with uh, carbapenem-resistant uh, bacteria. And so sometimes our antibiotics can be a little bit uh, insufficient for these patients. So adding a second treatment could also help to treat them as uh, Professor Kirchstein just uh, told us. The second aim that can to nowadays be very interesting for us is the COVID-19 patients, but I will not uh, speak about that longer because it was already largely presented previously. Uh, we will go straight to this uh, first clinical case. So this patient is a, a male. He's uh, 67 years old. He has hypertension and stage renal disease, and he's under peritoneal dialysis. He's uh, doing dialysis at home with a peritoneal catheter, and he's actually doing his treatment very well. Uh, this patient is usually in a good condition, but for one week, he presents with a fever and asthenia. So he will uh, go to the emergency room in our hospital, and then the doctors in the emergency room uh, find, think that this patient has a sepsis. He has a mot motlings, he has low mean arterial pressure, and he has uh, alteration of consciousness. So he's admitted to the intensive care unit. And at admission, this patient has an increased heart rate uh, over 130. He has low mean arterial pressure, 60, and he has a very high procalcitonin uh, level, as you can see here, uh, 95 nanogram per milliliter. So very quickly, uh, in the first hour, we'll start antibiotics for this patient after uh, we draw the blood cultures, of course, and we also did some um, puncture of the, the abdominal liquid. Uh, the patient was also started with norepinephrine and very quickly with CRT because he had an indication for renal replacement therapy. When we started renal replacement therapy for this patient, we also started the hemoperfusion with CERAF 100 but it uh, was requiring the time to insert the catheter and to mount all of the system. So he was started with CRT and CRF 100 some hours after the antibiotics. This patient has positive blood cultures with uh, medicine resistant staphylococcus, 
and actually he was very uh, fastly improving and he was resumed with norepinephrine after one day uh, and discharged to the nephrology ward at day five. This is a more close up look at what happened to the patient during the first day of his ICU stay. So he was admitted here and he received antibiotics in the first hour. And here, the red line is the norepinephrine requirements. And as you can see, even though he received the antibiotics, he had a very fast uh, uh, worsening of his clinical condition. We started continuous venal, veno, venous hemodialysis here with the CRAF 100 for four hours. And when we started CRAF 100, we observed a stabilization of his uh, hemodynamic state, and then we could decrease uh, norepinephrine uh, requirements. So this is something like a, a, good, a simple case. The patient has a highly suspected bacteremia. We start the, the treatment at quite an early stage and we can see an improvement in the hemodynamic. Uh, it is the occasion for us to speak about some technical aspects. And I see in the audience that there is a numerous, uh, very uh, uh, people that know very well about the hemoperfusion, the CERA, but maybe there is also uh, some, somebody who wants to start this treatment and already never tried it. So uh, I would like to say to, to these uh, colleagues that doing hemoperfusion is not complicated and you have to start it simple because it is uh, easy. So it depends on what uh, is your favorite modality in your ICU. You can do it either with uh, CVHD, CVH, uh, CVHDF, uh, intermittent hemodialysis, or also as hemoperfusion as a standalone therapy. Anyway, what, whatever the modality, you have to add an anticoagulation for the circuit, which can be either regional acetate calcium, heparin, uh, other like agatrogon, but of course, not nothing. And maybe you could think, okay, but it is a heparin on this cartridge, so it's not supposed to, to clot. Actually, this does not work like this. It's a heparin on surface. It ha doesn't have exactly the same properties as the um, soluble uh, heparin. And also uh, when the patient is a uh, high inflammatory, like in the sepsis, uh, he has a very high clotting rate. So you need anyway uh, to have uh, anticoagulation for the circuit. So different configurations uh, can, be, can be done. Uh, if your patient needs renal replacement therapy, you can use the, the CERAF as a combination therapy. So in this uh, schema here, you can see that the cartridge can, is inserted between the blood pump and the dialyzer. So the blood, uh, the blood flows, flows sorry, for the blood pump, enters seraph cartridge, flows out seraph, and then dialyzer and back to the patient, like here on the CVHD. Uh, what you observe when you start the treatment without seraph, then you insert here the seraph cartridge, and you can observe this an increase in the pre filter pressure. So this is totally uh, normal since the seraph cartridge is inserted after. Uh, the um, pre-filter uh, pressure sensor. This is a, the other configuration. It's hemoperfusion as a standalone therapy. It has to be preferred if there is no indication of renal re replacement therapy. There is also a need for anticoagulation and it is available with different generators. You can use it either with a, a, a generator that is designed for hemoperfusion. It's only one blood pump and your cartridge, or you can use it with a re renal replacement therapy generator with a special uh, circuit for hemoperfusion alone. And then you use only one of the pumps. Technical aspects to begin. So I know that there is very experimented people among the audience, but also some uh, people that maybe want to begin with hemoperfusion. So first you need to write a protocol, and this is what we did. Uh, with the patient selection, what patient will need this ter therapy, which, how you will choose your patients, uh, the mounting protocol of the device and the treatment monitoring. So mounting protocol is something very easy. You need to rinse the cartridge then insert in the circuit and treat the patient. 
but also you have to teach and train your team. And I think this is very important for the treatment to run smoothly. Uh, the, the team has to be trained and to know about the treatments. And this is uh, very important in our ICUs because the nurses, they have many treatments to, to, to do, to apply to the patients. So they need to be confident with the treatment. So we have to teach and train them uh, to, to help them participate in the hemoperfusion treatments. And also in the IC, it's important to think about the night teams, people that are taking shifts. Uh, it's good if the doctor uh, that arrived for the shift uh, doesn't discover the hemoperfusion uh, when he arrives uh, at the end of the day, but if he already knows about the treatment. And also, uh, maybe you noticed, but very often the most severe patients they arrive in the middle of the night because it's always like this. So it's good if the night teams are able to start also the hemoperfusion. So now that you are ready to start, you need to find the right treatment for the right patients. With hemoperfusion, it's like with antibiotics. There is many antibiotics, but it's, you need to choose the good antibiotics for the good patients and the good bacteria, of course. Same for the hemoperfusion. You need to find the good hemoperfusion therapy for the good patient, and it depends on what is the timing uh, of the, the sepsis evolution for this patient. This is the second clinical case. It's uh, also a male, 74 years old, with hypertension, cardiovascular disease. He has chronic kidney disease, and his history starts beginning of July with a right colectomy. Initially, everything is going smoothly, but at day four uh, postoperative, the patient has a septic shock. So he's taken to the radiology for X-ray, and we can diagnose a postoperative peritonitis. So the patient is taken to the surgery theater for second surgery. Uh, he has a, a, a cleaning of the, the, cavi the peritoneal cavity and uh, also a removal of the, the part of the digestive tube that were perforated. Then he's admitted to the intensive care unit. At the admission in intensive care unit, the patient uh, very quickly shows to have a multi-organ failure. He has a huge microcirculatory dysfunction with mottlings all over the body. He has high lactate level, he has very low SCVO2. And so this patient is of course started on vasopressors, uh, antibiotics, but they were of course started during the surgery and all of the supportive measures that we can have in the ICU. We start also uh, Sarah for this patient and let's uh, look up more closely at what happened. So H0, this is the surgery and the first admission administration of antibiotics for this patient arrival in the ICU and starts off the CVVHD because the patient obviously has an indication for renal replacement therapy. Even with all of these measures, uh, the norepinephrine requirements uh, are going up and the patient is worsening very, very uh, fastly. He has a lact lactate over nine millimol per liter and central SCVO2 over 80%. So this is uh, reflecting a very bad microcirculatory condition. Then we start CRF 100 and hemodynamics stabilize. And after a few hours, it will improve. So he will have a clearance of his lactate and also SCVO2 will go back to more uh, normal range. So the microcirculation will improve, but also the, micro, the macro circulation. This patient had negative blood cultures, uh, but we know that after we started the, the CRF100, of course, when we started the treatment, we didn't know yet that uh, blood culture would be negative. Uh, however, because he had antibiotics previously, it was not uh, very surprising. And also because the source, the source of infection was controlled. Uh, is it totally abnormal that we observed a positive effect of the CRF100? Maybe not, because maybe we could also remove the pathogen associated molecular patterns and also some toxins. This reminds us about uh, sepsis and uh, Professor Rinley already showed you uh, something like this, but uh, I will say some words uh, 
also. Sepsis is a dysregulated host response to infection. So sepsis implies to have one pathogen infection and a dysregulated host response. Everything starts here with the pathogen, the pathogen express pathogen-associated molecular patterns, which has recognized by the pathogen re pattern recognition receptor. And then it will activate the leukocyte, and the leukocyte will release in the circulation pro- and anti-inflammatory mediators, which are the cytokinic storm. Cytokinic storm will participate in the organ injury and damage cells. Damaged cells will also express damage-associated molecular patterns, and then we have this vicious circle of uh, dysregulated inflammation. So most of the um, blood purification therapies uh, aim at uh, modulating this vicious circle, and their main targets are pathogen-associated molecular patterns and cytokines. So numerous devices have been developed to remove these two targets. It could be sometimes confusing because they are all called blood purification, hemoperfusion, maybe sometimes sorbents, but they don't have the same target. And this is very important to know because uh, maybe all the patients don't need the same treatment. So you need to find a good treatment for the good patient. Where uh, Seraph is interesting, it's here at the very beginning because Seraph can remove the pathogen. So if you remove the pathogen, maybe you can prevent the activation of this vicious circle. So Seraph is at the very beginning of the sepsis and at the key player of the, the sepsis. Decreasing the bacterial blood load, uh, it's of course uh, very interesting to prevent the activation of immunity but also uh, it is directly uh, correlated with hospital mortality and septic shock. Here on the right side, you can see a uh, time to positivity of blood culture. So the shorter it is, the higher is the bacterial blood load. And you can see that uh, on the green line, when you have a higher bacterial blood load, you have a higher hospital mortality and also higher septic shock. These patients are more severe. Here on the left side, uh, this very interesting uh, thing also shows that uh, the first time to positivity is not so relevant for the outcomes. There is no difference between surviving and diseasing patients. However, it's the second time to positivity, the second blood culture uh, time to positivity, which is very correlated with mortality. So it means that uh, if you do the good treatment and that your patient improves, has a decrease of bacterial blood load, then he will less uh, die. What to ultimately remove? So we spoke about bacteria, of course, uh, but there is also maybe cytokines that can be removed by the seraph. It's not the main point of the seraph. But some, of, uh, some studies already suggested that Seraph was also able to remove some of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, such uh, and uh, inflammatory mediators, such as uh, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, uh, and some others that you can see. So this is also another, uh, uh, another mechanism of action that can be uh, used with this hemoperfusion device. And what we do not want to remove because some things are good for the patients and in this precise situation of sepsis, it is actually the antibiotics, of course. We do not want to remove antibiotics when we treat a septic patient with seraph, of course. So this is a very nice study, it's an in vitro study uh, using plasma of patients and the plasma was um, flowing through the seraph cartridge. And actually, you can see the reduction ratio during the first five minutes of the treatment. And for all of these antivirals and antibiotics, it is quite low, except for these two antibiotics, the gentamicin and probramicin, where the reduction ratio is quite high. So what this study tells us is that for most antibiotics, seraph is safe. It does not remove the antibiotic. However, it still is a good practice to do a therapeutic drug monitoring. So we recommend to do therapeutic drug monitoring because it's actually good practices. 
And if you have to administer uh, aminoglycosides, of course, the first dose, and if the patient is uh, under severe septi sepsis or septic shock, you cannot delay the treatment. But if the patient uh, already had the treatment, is stabilized, uh, he's not in a, in a severe condition, then maybe you can wait the end of the four hours of the treatment to administer the aminoglycosides. And you also have to monitor this treatment. So when to start a CRF100 session? If you want to prevent the activation of this uh, immune virus circle, you have to start it as soon as possible. However, uh, starting soon, it means that you cannot wait for the results of the blood culture, because most of the time you will know that blood culture are positive 6, 10, 12, 20 hours later. So it's maybe already too late to start the treatment. So you have to use uh, your clinical uh, tools and to start the treatment if there is a suspicion of bacteremia before the results of blood culture. So what are the situations? Endocarditis, septic shock, because as you saw previously, uh, high uh, bacterial blood load can lead to septic shock, catheter-related bloodstream infection, or maybe particular uh, indications. So do not wait for positive blood culture. Monitor the efficacy of the treatment. So you can do again blood cultures, uh, see how is the time to positivity, how is it uh, increasing? So if the time to positivity increases, it means that you have a lower uh, blood uh, bacterial load. And do your patient have an, has an hemodynamic improvement? You also have to control the treatment dose. So what does it mean? It means that you have to take care of the blood flow rate. If your blood flow rate is very uh, slow, then maybe you, have, you will treat less blood during the same uh, time session. So maybe you could increase the timing, uh, of, uh, the timing of the time of use of one cartridge. So treatment duration. Uh, treatment stability, how is your uh, circuit going? Is it stable or do you always have some uh, stops of the, um, the blood pump because the patient, uh, because the catheter is not working well or because the patient has to undergo some procedures or, well, or something else? And also the patient weight, of course, also uh, if your patient uh, is uh, with a very high obesity or, or not. So blood flow rate and treatment duration, I think it's some important key points. And also repeat if necessary. Uh, you can repeat the treatment, of course, if the source control uh, is not uh, fully controlled, if you still have positive blood cultures. Uh, and my last word, finally. So high steroid targets for extracorporeal blood purification in sepsis include cytokines and endotoxins. But CERAF 100 is different. It is capable of removing pathogens from the blood. It is easy to use either as a standalone therapy or inside a renal replacement circuit. And maybe in the future, removing pathogens uh, could help us to treat extensively drug-resistant bacteria or certain viruses with few other therapeutic options, such as the COVID-19, of course. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Céline, for this presentation. Uh, I would like to congratulate uh, our two speakers because as you could see, they were able to uh, give some talks uh, uh, which uh, combined uh, theoretical aspects and uh, practical considerations. So that was extremely, extremely uh, interesting. Uh, I think we're gonna take, uh, although we don't have uh, so some, some much time, but we're gonna take uh, five, 10 minutes to discuss. Uh, I don't know if you have any uh, questions. Uh, some of the questions could be sent on the chat or on the q and I would also ask the two speakers to write their email addresses on the, on the chat. So maybe some questions could be asked uh, later on uh, by the audience. Um, I have one question for, for Jan. It was about the PO2 improvement from uh, his studies. I think that, that was very interesting to see that you could improve the oxygen parameters in your studies 
Did you see the same thing in your in the COSA registry with your COVID patients? And I guess in some patients you may have seen an improvement of the oxygen parameters in these COVID patients. How do you explain these oxygen parameter improvements uh, with Seraph? Um, the the improvement is really striking, and I have a hard time to explain that with the improvement of infection control or uh, reduction in 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 pathogens. Um, what it it was re very reminiscent to me to an improvement in ventilation perfusion mismatch. Um, although I cannot prove it, but the the abrupt onset of that was really striking, and maybe um, we have more than just uh, pathogen removal, but also removal of uh, of of larger um, um, uh, fragments, uh, especially in those patients with high D dimer levels. Um, that that uh, could be. Uh, that could be uh, play a role. And uh, yes, uh, the preliminary uh, examination in the COSA registry uh, tells us that that um, uh, there was um, um, uh, also an improvement in the Horowitz index of those patients. Uh, although I would be cautious because there are so many parameters we are changing in the ICU. And uh, of course, in an in a online registry, where people document uh, parameters free of charge, we, we limited ourselves. So uh, we, we are not um, uh, we are not having all the information like the you know respir respirator settings and so on. Uh, maybe I can use the chance because there were two German questions uh, to uh, to also um, uh, refer to those. So one question was, what, what kind of uh, mode of therapy uh, would be our preferred one? And I think uh, it really depends on the setting. If your patient is still on the normal ward or in the intermediate care ward, um, uh, you're fine with intermittent treatment, either hemoperfusion or in a dialysis patient with a severe infection uh, in combination with dialysis treatment. We do a lot of SLED treatment, um, and it's also easy to, to combine the two. In the ICU setting, it's either SLED or CRT. Um, and the, the other question was, what is the maximum um, um, adsorber uh, or filter use? We limit ourselves to 24 hours because uh, we have um, safety data, um, at least in, in bacterial uh, infections uh, that, that clearly show that up to 24 hours, there's no uh, bacterial overgrowth um, and uh, the the seraph is still performing very powerful so, so Malin Thierry Seffa did those experiments um, so I'm confident all the way up to 24 hours and this is what we also see in the COSA registry I would not recommend to use it longer would it be dangerous I don't know um, uh, but I would do a cut at 24 hours um, and uh, I think these were the German um, uh, questions. One question refers to the blood flow. And this is interesting because our American colleagues introduced the concept of treated blood volume. And I think this is really interesting. Um, so they aim for 70 to 100 liters of uh, blood volume to be treated. Um, and I think it really depends on the urgency of the infection. If you have a really severe um, infection, if you have a perforated bowel uh, and you know that you have bacteremia, I would probably rather go for one uh, brisk and uh, um, high volume treatment with a high blood pump speed and then um, use a second seraph uh, to um, have a slow flow treatment um, overnight, um, uh, but um, we we still need more data to sub substantialize this uh, choice that is uh, mainly based on personal um, uh, experience. Um, 
uh, uh, and one more question I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take from Stefan Mitzner. He, he asked whether heparin uh, anticoagulation would not interfere with the binding of the pathogens to the adsorber. This is a brilliant question. Of course, I, I did expect that. Um, and when we look at the concentrations, we need, uh, for instance, for anoxaparin, we need five micrograms per liter to inhibit the binding of um, the virus uh, to the cell. Um, uh, but in the, the dose we're giving uh, to patients is, um, uh, is one, uh, um, uh, is, uh, is, is, is a quarter to a fifth of that dose. So I, um, in reality, uh, our doses with heparin we give for anticoagulation are not high enough to interfere with the, um, with the seraph interaction. And uh, um, if you will, you have a highly packed, tamed heparin inside of the seraph that is so highly concentrated uh, that it does the job very well. Uh, the systemic anticoagulation um, uh, does uh, not substantially interfere with that interaction. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, we have uh, plenty of questions which show the, how interesting this topic is. Uh, Celine, uh, you said uh, clearly that we can use the seraph with all the different kind of modalities uh, of renal replacement therapy. And you also said that we can use with heparin and citrate. Uh, there is a question. Do you have uh, any, uh, what, because a lot of people now use citrate, uh, and I, I would like to highlight the fact that it's doable to run this therapy with citrate. Can you confirm that? Because that's an important question. It's a key question. Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Uh, so in our ICU, that's what we do, and that's what we did for all of our uh, uh, seraph cases, and it went very well. We had no problem. Uh, so we conducted our anticoagulation with citrate calcium exactly uh, as usually with the same targets, same ranges, and uh, the seraph didn't uh, change anything. We, we didn't experience uh, any modification of our anticoagulation, uh, no unexpected events or whatever. So I think it's going very well with citrate calcium during the CVHD or CVH. And also I would just like to say that I totally agree with the, the treatment of blood volume and treatment dose is very important. And I think the treatment dose has to be adapted to the situation of the patient. Indeed, if he has a very high bacterial uh, dose, maybe you can do a high treatment at the be beginning with a uh, high blood flow rate. And then later on, maybe you can change the cartridge for a second one with, for the, the second period of time, uh, a longer period of time. But actually on citrate uh, calcium uh, anticoagulation, the blood flow rate cannot be so much changed since it's really correlated with the anticoagulation. So for us, uh, we choose our blood flow rate for the anticoagulation with citrate calcium in order not to give too much citrate to the patient. Uh, so because we have low blood flow rate, maybe we should use our uh, cartridge for a longer time in order to treat the good uh, blood volume that we want. Celine, how do you explain that in one, I think it was one of your cases that you had a negative blood culture, you implemented the seraph, and then there was a huge hemodynamic improvement. How do you explain that for, uh, for our audience? Yes, this was uh, unexpected because uh, the patient was really uh, worsening very quickly and we could see the mottling expanding uh, hours after hours. Uh, but actually, when we started uh, with Seraph, uh, it started to stabilize, and then we could uh, decrease the norepinephrine dose. So maybe even with the negative blood culture, we still have uh, pathogen-associated molecular proteins that are circulating, and also toxins that can be uh, in, of course, a smaller extent than the bacteria, but also absorbed in the cartridge. So maybe it was this, uh, this effect. It's one case, but it's interesting still to, 
you see on notice that. And blood cursors, they are not 100% sensitive. So this patient already had the source control. He already had the antibiotics a few hours before. So maybe the bacterial load in the blood was low, but was still activating the immune uh, vicious circle. Okay, and I think maybe this could be the last question because this is a very interesting question. I think it deserves to be discussed because now you, you clearly said, Celine, that we cannot wait for these uh, the results of these blood cultures because sometimes we have the blood cultures in 24 hours, 48 hours. But then they say, is there a place for this new tool that we have in microbiology that gives uh, the, the results of the uh, you know, the, what the, the bug is in the blood very quickly. Uh, and do you think we can combine the, the use of this tool with this, uh, with the seraph actually? This could be a yes. question for, for you too, for Jan also. I think that uh, moni better monitoring uh, our immune state and uh, septic state of the patient is a key point uh, to be able to decide when to start hemoperfusion blood purification therapies and what technique to start. And of course, if we know very early that we have a pathogen in the blood, then we should start uh, very early with the seraph in order to prevent the further activation of the immune system. So I think these techniques that totally have their, their place in this situation, for sure. Yeah, and what do you think? You're on mute, Jan, I think. Do you agree that this test could be interesting with the seraph? I think your microphone is on mute, uh, Jan. You say that you agree, but I think we cannot hear you anymore. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> Jan is uh, out. So I think, yeah, I think Jan, is, uh, Jan agrees that, uh, and I think uh, I thank very much. Uh, no, no, I'm, for... I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, go, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> My screen was too big uh, uh, to answer the questions. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, swift and, and early treatment in combination with uh, antibiotics or one question was, what about a, a, a focus? Well, it's, it's, it's always uh, desirable to remove the focus of the infection, uh, but sometimes you cannot do it like an ECMO line that is infected uh, in, in the patient where, where you don't have other exit uh, sites left. So, uh, so then of course you, you can do the treatment without um, 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 removing the focus, but this of course should, should not be um, should not be the preferred uh, option. Uh, and speaking of ECMO, um, there, there are, have been patients treated uh, um, with the ECMO uh, and uh, the seraph uh, with no, with no um, uh, problem uh, reported. And um, so I think that uh, that is also an important uh, issue. And there, there's one uh, specific, uh, specific, uh, specific question um, that goes to France. Uh, it asks about uh, the most important thing, obviously, these days, um, the reimbursement. <laughs> so uh, uh, I think that that is also uh, a question. Uh, what about reimbursement of hemoperfusion in, in, in France? Uh, so this is uh, coming from Germany. Maybe we're looking for guidance um, uh, as we do with uh, European policy. So maybe you, you can enlighten us uh, about that. Okay, so <laughs> we have uh, hemoperfusion codes, uh, but actually we still don't try them. Uh, it's not so developed. So for now we don't uh, have uh, troubles like we use the, the treatments if our pharmacist can, uh, can purchase them. Uh, and I think that yes, because it seems very interesting and we hope to be able to use them more. We will have to think about the, this point of reimbursement because it's also part of the job. And we will maybe try to see if these codes uh, can be used uh, for reimbursement. And I'm also very sure that uh, with the randomized trials and that because there is more and more evidence on the efficacy of this treatment, it will be easier to obtain some reimbursement because for sure, if uh, you treat better the patient the pa and the patient spends less time in the ICU, uh, then at the end, uh, the total cost is probably uh, lower. Uh, 
uh, even if you include the cost of the, the hemoperfusion device. There was one, one question I would like to, to, to answer as well. It was about the capacity. Well, you know, Xterra Medical is a um, US company and obviously uh, the Seraph was designed at a time where the oversized me uh, attitude was still in place. Uh, so in, in my view, the, the Seraph uh, is really oversized in terms of capacity. So it, we tried really hard um, 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 in the lab to, to find a point where the seraph is saturated with, uh, uh, with bacteria and we were not able even using industrial strength doses of bacteria. And again, uh, Malin Therese uh, Seffer did those experiments. Um, she was not able to, to, uh, to actually uh, reach the limit of the seraph. So capacity is not an issue. Um, um, and for that, um, the, the optimal blood flow, I think, really depends on, on um, the kind of machine you're using and the setting. So I would feel comfortable using, using a blood flow of 100 to 150 cc's in an ICU. Um, and um, uh, it's even possible to go down to 50 cc's if you use a normal central line. But for a severely infected patient, I think that that would be a little bit um, uh, less than than I would personally wish for um, in in um, uh, such a, a clinical scenario. So uh, just to answer that question. And yeah, and I think there is another one which is very important to answer: is how long shall we keep the filter? Twenty four hours or or more or less? What do you? Uh, well, yeah, that's we, an important point. Yeah, we, we have safety data all the way to 24 hours and efficacy data all the way to 24 hours. So I would feel very comfortable recommending the use all the way to 24 hours. Um, um, and I think more than that, I would not uh, recommend to use the Seraph. I would not use it for 72 hours like a CRT system. So I, I, I think I would rather use a second one. Uh, um, um, and um, um, But we don't have um, many data on, on that. It could be that we could use it for even more than 24 hours, but I personally uh, in, in our setting, 24 hours is the, the currently defined uh, limit of use. I see that there is still room for a lot of research with this device. There is still a lot of things we need to, to, to know uh, more than, than what we do right now. So uh, if you want to participate to uh, some, uh, some research protocol, I think you can, if you want to uh, enroll patients in uh, in uh, in Jan's registry. I think it could be uh, also doable, uh, and and uh, I think um, this is how we're going to end this uh, webinar. I would like to thank very much uh, our two speakers for this uh, very very interesting uh, session. We had a lot of questions. It was it was practical. It was theoretical. So that was uh, fantastic in, in my view. Uh, so again, thank you very much. Thank you very much for Xterra for, for organizing this uh, symposium. And with that, I would like to uh, say good night or a good afternoon uh, to everybody. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thanks for attending and have a great night.